Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Clarence Rockland Councillor Trevor Stewart. But before we get into today's interview, I want to take a moment and remind municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast here in Canada that we are always looking for more incredible guests like today's guest, Councillor Stewart. So if you are in elected office in any part of this country and have a passion, like I do, for municipal politics, reach out today. Now, on to our interview. Councillor Stewart, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, I want to start with my basic question that starts all my interviews, so you're no exception. Trevor, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Oh, God. Well, thanks so much, Chris, for, for having me on this. Wow, really hammered me out on the first one. Um, listen, I think it came um, came a lot from my parents. Uh, both my mom and my dad grew up um, really, really poor. And um, we didn't, we are not from a political family, not at all. Uh, so I have no, uh, no family members whatsoever in politics. They barely even voted. So it, um, seeing how parts of the system worked and didn't work for a lot of, of personal and close family members of mine definitely affected me and said, look, uh, if I want to change this, uh, I think I have a, a sense of duty to changing it. Um, so that's more systemic, but also I'm a, I'm a francophone and a very proud francophone at that and, and I, I really got my I started grinding my teeth in politics through Franco Ontarian politics. So I have a really big sense of duty to that community as well, to the Francophone community of this province, um, and to French Canadians in general, um, to trying to, to, to make sure that, you know, the language and the culture doesn't suffer from assimilation as much as it has. So uh, and seeing it kind of die down in real time has definitely you know, delved in me a bit of a sense of, of action and, and wanting to do uh, as much as I could to try to, to halt it and promote it and also try to better my own community. So sure. what happened, what happens in 2022 that makes uh, you go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for someone who has self-described comes from a non-political family who wants to give back to their community. You make the decision in 2022 to uh, ultimately put your name forward municipally and I want to talk about why municipal first, because that's the crux of what this show is all about, why people join the municipal realm. For you, what was it that drew you to the municipal realm compared to giving back on an issue like Francophone Affairs that's traditionally more provincial, federal issues compared to a municipal issue? So for you, what was it about municipal that drew you? Yeah, Chris, it's not a very glamorous answer. It was my road. Um, it's awful, I know, but it, it really, that was kind of the big Kickstarter. My uh, my parents first moved to my community. Um, they, uh, the road was not paved and they were like, oh, it'll get, get developed. And um, it very much so did not, it was not paved. And it was, it was awful. And, and residents of my community can attest to it. it. It's one of the worst roads, Gagne Road, one of the worst roads in the municipality. And so I said, look, um, I pushed, um, I got involved the, uh, in municipal politics uh, a bit before the 2022 election. I said, started going to city council meetings, started pushing councillors, my own councillor included, to get more funding for, um, for road infrastructure and specifically for our rural roads, because we're, um, we also have a very, very big portion, rural portion, obviously, of our municipality. I represent one of the, the big rural wards. So it's just trying to getting into that system and trying to enact change as, a, as just a citizen right a resident like any other i found incredibly frustrating and i said you know what and when 2022 came came around i said like that's it i've got to i've got to do something i've got to throw my name in the ring i can't i'm a strong believer in um put your money where your mouth is right i don't want to just complain i want to get stuff done and i want to put action um, into place. So that to me was the ultimatum, but honestly, it was a road. It, we, we hit a big bumper not too long ago and it busted out our oil tank and it was like thousands of dollars of damages. And I was like, that's it. Like that's, that was the catalyst. You, you, you talk about the, uh, the road being the main catalyst to get involved, but when you go out door knocking, because I'm assuming you had worked on campaigns, you probably may have or may not have worked on campaigns prior to your uh, initial entrance into being on the ballot campaigning. Um, 
were roads a major issue in the last provincial, uh, the last municipal election for you that you were hearing from your neighbors that, yes, that road's bad, but our road is bad as well, and we do need more infrastructure funding? Or were there issues that were coming up that were diverse in nature, and you were pleasantly happy that people were talking about the issues because when I talk to counselors, one of the big things that I take away is there's an apathetic nature when it comes to municipal politics. And I just want to know in the last municipal election for you, were people talking about issues that were important to the ward seven residents, which you represent, but also to uh, Clarence Rockland as well. Yeah. Great question. Um, I, I think my, my residents are, are, ex- are might may, might be an exception. I, th- I think that they were really involved, right? And as soon as I got into politics, so my, my community has been there for quite a bit of time, and a lot of the residents that were there had been there for literally generations. Um, and so they were there for pre-amalgamation. We amalgamated, um, if I'm not mistaken, in the early 2000s. Um, we amalgamated with Clarence and Rockland, two municipalities decided to amalgamate. And uh, to this day, a lot of those residents who have been there for a while, it, it's still a bit of a tough amalgamation because it does, we do end up with essentially four rural wards. Um, if I'm being honest, it's really two rural wards with two semi-rural wards and then two urban wards. Yeah. So yeah. the resources are very much divided and, and there is a perception amongst my residents that we aren't getting enough. Rural hasn't gotten enough. Ever since we amalgamated, it's all been about Rockland, Rockland, Rockland. Um, I think there's there's obviously some truth to that statement. If so many residents do think it, I think it, it's true. And, and through looking through a lot of the budgets uh, and just at our road infrastructure, uh, you know, all of our gravel roads are in the, the rural parts of uh, the municipality. So um, there's definitely some truth to it. And it's something that I definitely picked up on. And growing up there, it's something I listened to a lot and um, definitely was a major part of the campaign. But a lot of residents also, I noticed COVID had a really big impact. Um, we used to be a really big rural um, and francophone community, and a lot of folks moved out. And a lot of folks moved in from places like Toronto and specifically Orleans, which is a neighboring community in Ottawa, right? Not too far from, from my own. So we had a lot of folks who had just moved in the past two years. Uh, so they were completely new to the area. Um, and, and I found a lot of those folks to be more like, I'm pretty happy with what I got. Like, I'm not too sure what's going on. But a lot of the folks who have been there for a really long time were a lot more resilient on on, on the issues that cared to them. And, you know, road was definitely the major one, um, but also high taxes was really big. Lack of municipal services was really big. Uh, I also had some really good conversations about economic development, which I wasn't expecting to have, but we definitely did. And, and, and right, beautification of the ward and, and attracting tourism in the ward was also really big. So it, um, it, was, it was nice because it, Never really knew what you were going to get. Uh, and I definitely got all types of flavors, but folks were definitely, you know, I, I heard the typical, like, I don't like Trudeau. And I'm like, well, different part of politics. And also, like, I'm not like, this is municipal. Uh, I don't know if you're happy with when your garbage is being picked up, right? It's not anything more high level than that. So uh, other than that, though, it was um, the issues were pretty diverse, except for, for, for rural and roads and roads, which was pretty big. And, and I had worked on campaigns quite a bit previously, so uh, kind of brought a lot of that campaign experience to, to rural door knocking, which is um, definitely different than, than urban door knocking of any kind. So it, it created a shift, but people were really happy just to have someone at their door. So we're going to talk about the city as a whole in the next segment. And then we're going to talk about my favorite subject. You just mentioned is tourism in a few in the last segment of the conversation. But I want to stick on the role of a counselor and yourself. Um, You're coming up to one year being in office. I think actually in October, it will be one year. So just short of a year from being in office. For you, what's been the biggest learning curve of being an elected official at a municipal level for yourself? Because uh, a lot of provinces are heading into a new uh, municipal cycle. Saskatchewan's going to an election next year. Uh, A few other municipalities are going to be going in two years. A few other provinces are going to be going in two years. What advice and what educational uh, education did you learn in the last year that you would want people to know who are looking at getting involved in municipal politics? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. It's, I found out very quickly, it's about the long game, right? It's about compromise is so, so important. Um, 
if you stick to your guns and you, you, you nail your, your your nails in the board and you don't move, then you're not going to get anything done. Um, that was that was quintessential because again, I, I did come from an, a bit of a frustrated resident perspective myself, right, about the road and everything, and I was like, I want to get stuff done immediately and kind of plowed in on the first, but it's you can't, you know, you got to have a more managed approach and you got to hear both sides and sometimes you got to move a bit with your position, but I think that's uh, our specifically our municipality has been has been good in the past term. I've been lucky, I find. Uh, I have a really good council. My mayor is very uh, open to discussion, really open with us, and so we're able to compromise. Obviously, I don't see eye to eye to them on everything, but I think that's that comes with the beauty of a municipal council race, right? So um, that's been how much does respect issue. how much does respect come into play? Uh, so it definitely does. Look, it's not I, I'm. I'm one of the youngest, I'm the youngest on council by quite a bit. Uh, me and another uh, another councillor, we're, we're, we're very young. Um, and we're very young in the municipality's history as well. There hasn't been very many young councillors like us. So it's, that uh, I feared would come into play. And, and to a certain respect it has. Um, but I have been lucky where, um, I, th I think folks, not only are my city council colleagues, but also the administration has been like, these people represent duly, they've been duly elected uh, and they represent, whether we like it or not, a volition of voters, right? And and they have a message that carried with voters, obviously. Um, and with that does come respect. I will say though, and this, I've been in politics for quite a bit of time, uh, never on the elected side, this is my first elected position, but that, that word counselor brings with it so much more respect. Um, people listen to you in conversation when usually they would throw aside your advice. Um, and, and just because of that. So I, I was, I think that was the thing I was most taken aback by, but just being a counselor brings you, uh, gives you a seat at the table and people do end up listening to you just because of that title. Do you think that should be that way though? Oh God, no, no, it shouldn't. <laughs> no, absolutely it should not, uh, right? We, we should be able to, to hear folks based off of their experience and not their titles. Um, Unfortunately, that's the state that we're at right now. And, and, and look, I, I do consider myself nonetheless lucky, right? I'm a young person and I'm still, I still managed to get myself elected. Um, there are a lot of folks who, who, who weren't able to in the past because of other barriers. So I do consider myself um, quite lucky. And I, I do, with, with people with different backgrounds, when they're at the table, I find titles mean less, right? We're, we're giving less importance to them, and I think that's a good thing, right? Because we're able to just listen to people, their personal perspectives, and what they've gone through, and the advice that they need to give. And ultimately, we should be listening to people, not titles. So, yeah, I, I, I do. I think it's it's need for a change. I, I want to talk about the role of a counselor here again for a second, and I wanted to talk about balancing the needs of uh, your ward residents versus the city as a whole. Because while you were elected by the people of your ward, you were there to represent the entire city. And I think you know where this question is going to go here, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How do you balance the needs of the city as a whole with the needs of your residents? Because you can't look at issues anymore as a Ward 7 counselor. You have to look at it as a Clarence Rockland a counselor. So how do you see yourself balancing the needs of what your community needs? roads, infrastructure, beautification, economic development, with what needs are needed for the entire city as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. Again, and that falls into your previous question of what I learned, one of the biggest harbing, uh, one of the biggest learning curves. And, and I think it comes from that as well. Um, it's that, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a city councillor for Clarence Rockland and not just Hammond <laughs> and Jenny. Uh, so it's been it's been a tough learning curve. Um, ultimately, I view it through a lens perspective, right? Um, I think when we're talking about Clarence Rockland, I, I look at all the wards, um, but I also specifically take a look at the rural ones, not just Ward Seven, but also all the other four, all the other three municipal wards that are, are considered rural. Um, and I do bring that voice a lot more at council. Uh, that's a perspective that I, I tend to, when I look at budget, I look at from a rural perspective. Um, obviously, a lot of my residents do go into Rockland, right, to get city services, um, to shop, etc. So that's definitely something that I have in mind. But um, 
I think there is, again, a nice balance where I can look at the needs of my residents and the needs of rural people, but also still be able to make decisions for the rest of the city. And again, that comes with cooperation. So I'll sit down. Sometimes there is a, a big project in downtown Rockland. My residents might not really frequent that area. I personally might not frequent that area. So I'm going to sit down with the mayor. I'm going to sit down with those city council colleagues, uh, my councilor colleagues, and say, look, what are you hearing from your residents, right? What's the thought on it? And so that has been really useful uh, just to kind of sit down and be able to have that good relationship with my city council colleagues um, has been really, really good because you can't get a grasp on everything. You just can't. Um, our city's growing. We're getting really big. So there's a lot of projects that, you know, might be in, in a bit of the rearview mirror for certain councillors because it might not really affect them or their residents. So being able to sit down and have those frank conversations and be able to have that advice of that city councillor has been tremendous to make those decisions. You're right. You can't get a grasp on every single issue that's in put in front of you, but you get a council package, you have to review it, you have to look at the administration's recommendations, then you have to try to gauge from yourself, but also from your local residents of what they want on certain issues. Sometimes you're not able to do that on small zoning bylaws, but overall mm -hmm. for the large issues, you have to sort of engage with your residents. So when you go into that council chambers, when you vote on issues, you are doing it in the best interest of all your residents. How do you see yourself ensuring that when you walk into that council chambers, you're informed on what administration wants, informed on what your residents want, but not cemented in an idea of how you're going to vote until you actually hear from all sides at that council table, because you may have public hearings, people might come and voice their opinions at that meeting, a fellow councillor may give an opinion that you didn't think of. So how important is it for you to be informed but not too informed enough to not be able to make a different opinion when you walk into that council chambers. Yeah, so I'll take my first, I'll take my first budget, for example, which was hell of a learning curve, <laughs> right? You're elected and then within like a month and a half, it's like you're making multi-million dollar decisions. So that was quite something. But um, before that, I, I, I said, look, I'm gonna get uh, ahead of this. And so I met with, um, some really active community groups, specifically my ward. So for us, uh, one example is the, the Optimist Club in Hammond. Really, really active club. Um, a lot of a younger user base. They organize tons of events in the community. And I wanted, I was like, okay, let's have a sit down and let's see, uh, don't give me your wish list because you know, I'm not gonna be able to check everything off it, but let's see where your needs are at, right? Where do you think the city can, can improve? Where do you think we, uh, if we had some extra funding, where do you think it could best be used by uh, folks like yourself so i had an idea of what community groups in my area wanted and i spoke with some some local residents as well so i went in that council chamber with that in mind also i went through the whole document and asked my questions to the administration clarifying documents beforehand which was helpful to say the least so that i didn't look like a dummy on uh, on council and uh once then i just had a had a sit down with um uh, counselors one by one a lot of them uh, I didn't get to all of them, but I got to most of them where I just had to sit down chat and I said, look, what are your thoughts? Where are you at? Where's your head at on this? So again, beforehand, I kind of had an idea as to where discussions were going. Um, and that first, we, we spent two nights um, for two meetings looking at, uh, at council deliberations. And I think that was really helpful because after the first night, we'd gone through quite a bit and I was able to, the next day, talk to a lot of city councillors and say, look, I can't move on this, but maybe you can move on that and we can maybe divert a bit of money here because there's only so much we have, right? I mean, it's, uh, pertaining to, to budget. So it, it's a bit, we have to make some tough decisions, but being able to have that compromise and have those conversations is quintessential to the least. Do you, do, you, do you find that you're better informed when you're talking to people off the record than when you're on actually at the council meetings? Because you, you talk about that first budget meeting and you went to administration, you asked all your questions so you didn't look kind of uh, uh, out of place in that first meeting. 
are, is that where the real work gets done? And I'm not trying to be, I put you on the spot here, Trevor, but I feel mm-hmm. like you're up for this question because you kind of opened the door and I want to play in that, uh, yeah. Yeah, that hallway yeah. for a second. Did, did you find when you first got elected that most of the conversations that were happening, not at the council table, but actually behind like in camera or even in a uh, council uh, uh, sort of closed door meeting, but I know you're not supposed to make uh, actual uh, votes there. You're, you're just supposed to have a yeah. formal conversations is that where most of the work is getting done do you believe so for my situation i think it was a bit different because i again i was a first time counselor and i'm a yeah. young guy so i didn't the last thing i wanted was to you know i, I think there's an extra bias to folks who's like oh look at the young kid asking these stupid questions <laughs> at council. you know what i mean the young like, whippersnapper yeah. yep exactly <laughs> so i wanted to kind of avoid that so that's why i, I have this conversation with the administration and look some of them were kind of I was just really, if I asked that council, they were out of left field, right? They were, it was just procedural stuff, a lot of issues that I wasn't aware of at the time. Because again, you go from resident to counselor and then within a month you're voting on very important, very important things and big budgets. So I wanted to make sure that I was the best educator I could and that's why I had those conversations with the administration. But I, I think there's a certain level of it that, that, that counselors do talk amongst themselves. Obviously, everyone is well aware of quorum and making sure that we're not, you know, nobody's enough and that we're not making official decisions behind closed doors. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there is a certain banter to it. Um, but I mean, I say that, but then everything is off limits once we, once those cameras are on and we're back on, on council. It can go everywhere, right? I My clerk told me like, you never know what happens once the meeting starts. And it's so true. Like we, sometimes I had some agreements with certain counselors and then the meeting starts and we get into conversation and suddenly it's not at all what I was expecting, right? It doesn't reflect necessarily the conversation I had. That just happens. It's normal, right? I think it's good because people might be changing their opinion based off the debate we're having at council and at the council table. I think it's healthy, Um, but there is, it's a balance of both for sure. I want to talk about the personal life of a counselor because you are an elected official that doesn't get to go to Ottawa to do their job as an MP or Toronto, Queens Park to do your job as an MPP. You are in your riding. You're in your municipality 24-7. You go to the grocery store. I guarantee you've been stopped and probably asked questions about what's going on or talk about the uh, budget that has just come out probably earlier last year, the mill rate. You have probably questions posed to you all the time. Does it get to you? Have you found the balance of being a local politician and just being Trevor from time to time? God, good question. Um, <laughs> listen, I, I think I think I'm getting a good grip on it. Um, the thing is, I, I again, I, I started getting involved in politics when I was 15 years old, so I kind of saw what it was like. So I kind of knew what I was getting myself into. I, I knew that might be the case. And it has been, right? Sometimes you just have Tim Hortons and someone brings up, you know, the $1.2 million you spent on a roundabout. Like it just, it happens. Um, and I, I'm getting used to it, but I, I'm lucky enough that a lot of, uh, you know, my residents are, are really good. And I think going to community events is, is my big thing because if you're going to a community event, you see the counselor, it's totally acceptable to come up to them and have, and have that conversation. And I view it almost as an outlet. Like I'm at, and I'm, I'm at, I'm every community event I could because People can come up to me there and talk to me there. And so maybe if I'm at the bank, they won't, you know, stop me for, you know, 30 minutes to talk. But it, it really hasn't happened to that extent. Um, you know, I have had some calls at like eight in the morning and I'm like, maybe like 7 a.m. on a Sunday. Maybe let's let's try to keep those uh, at a more reasonable time. But other than that, it's, I think I've, I've managed to balance it quite well. The, the role of counselor has changed a lot over the last decade because of the rise of social media. I know you use social media. I think you're one of the few that actually on your council, according to the Rock, uh, uh, Clarence Rockland website, uh, you have links to your Facebook page and your Instagram, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you use it. How important is it for you to listen to all sides as a counselor, as someone who probably has seen their fair share of people being negative about the role of that you're doing or what vote you've done, how important is it to listen to all sides of the equation respectfully, but also ensure that you're not being inundated by some of the online misinformation and untruths that are out there that 
can be thrown towards municipal councillors? Yeah, I, I think it, it comes also with just learning to filter out what's, what's authentic, right? What yeah. is coming yeah. from a genuinely good place and what is coming from a cesspool of not good, um, right? Like if, if, if somebody's sending me a link to blog post one, two, three from Russian bot six, seven, like I'm not, right? That immediately is a non-starter to a conversation. And, and there are folks where you can start to have that conversation and it's evident, it's evident from the get-go. They're not coming from a good place, right? They're they're just there to argue, they're there to complain. And one of my biggest pet peeves is folks who just love the sound of their own voice. I know how ironic that is coming from a politician, I get it, but it's, I, I want action. I want to sit down and talk about solutions. Um, I just don't want to, you know, talk in circles about the problem the whole time. So it has been a bit of a learning curve to try to see what's authentic, what isn't. But uh, I have seen a lot of my residents appreciate that I'm available on, you know, they can just send me an Instagram DM and we can get a crew out on that pothole or something like that. It, it's more convenient. I think it, it, it has changed the nature and the dynamic of a, a counselor and uh, a resident, right? I find the younger the resident is, the, the less formal our interactions are, which I think is a good thing, right? I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just there to try to do the best we can for the community. So being accessible is so important to me and knowing that some residents do feel comfortable being able to, you know, send a messenger or send a DM on Instagram. I think it's acceptable. And I think it's, it's the way we're going, right? More and yeah. more folks I think are going to be using official channels like an official letter or an email a lot less. It's going to be a lot more informal. I don't think it's a bad thing. It makes things more accessible. So I want to turn to the city now as a whole. And before I start this line of questioning, I want to preface this segment by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy moved at council. This is the councillor's opinion. We seem to get lots of emails about this question. <laughs> so, councillor, in your opinion, at the time mm -hmm. of recording this episode, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Clarence Rockland today? Oh, God. Um, economic development is probably my number one. Um, if we're looking at our tax user base right now, um, I don't think we're bringing enough, enough um, commercial taxes at all. Um, we're, we're levying the burden on residents um, and on, on, on residential property tax, which I, I don't think is the right way to go. Um, we shouldn't be expecting to increase our um, tax user base by just building and building more developments. We need to develop an industri our industrial park. We do have one. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more that can be done, right? We're a very bilingual workforce. Uh, we're right next to the river, the Ottawa River. We're really not far from the city of Ottawa. I think there's a lot of opportunities for economic development. And I think we need to start putting ourselves out there as a municipality. We're growing immensely. Um, we are one of the fastest growing municipalities. Us and Russell are the two biggest in, in Eastern Ontario right now, if I'm not mistaken. So we need to start acting like that medium sized municipality that I think we are. And that comes with developing our, our industrial complex that comes with making us attractive to local to business, making us attractive to uh, corporations and making sure that we're providing enough incentives uh, that they're establishing in our neighborhoods, uh, but that they're also paying their fair share to make sure that we can build this city for everyone. You, earlier in the conversation, you talked about how the one thing that was eye-opening was about how much future planning that municipalities and councillors have to deal with. Um, economic development is one that is never going to go away. It's always going to be changing. It's always going to be something that municipalities are faced with. Um, you are not the first councillor. You are not the first elected official to talk to me about economic development. Other municipalities are in the exact same spot that you are. What sets Clarence Rockland apart from them to get those businesses? You talk about the proximity to Ottawa, but I talked to a mayor just up the highway from you and they said the exact same thing. So <laughs> what is setting you apart from other yeah. municipalities to say, this is where you need to invest. I know the other communities around us are great, but R Clarence Rockland is where the future is. Yeah, I think you just need to kind of start looking at uh, the, the folks who are settling into Clarence Rockland, right? We're getting uh, so many young families. We're getting a lot of, we have a very diverse uh, population right now and it's only growing. Uh, as I mentioned, we have an extremely bilingual workforce, which I think is a huge incentive, especially for national uh, companies who are looking to uh, 
establish themselves somewhere. And it, you only have to look at um, right now our industrial complex is is growing um, right now, which again step in the right direction, but a lot more needs to be done. And with that. Um, I think we're going to be enacting a lot of development, specifically exploring our waterfront uh, to see what we can do to make us more uh, more suitable for those businesses. I don't have a I don't have a, a major solution to uh, to economic development. No counselor will, uh, not the ones before me or after me. But um, we need to just start having those conversations and putting ourselves out there, which uh, we've been just. A bit. Um, I'm not going to say closed off, but definitely a little bit more um, reinforced than a lot of other municipalities. And just opening that door and going to companies, right, and sitting down and having those teams that are willing to have those conversations with companies and saying, "Look, this is what makes us attractive. Uh, come in, come take a visit, see if you like it." Um, I think is really good. And we have had a lot of companies come up uh, in the past about two months saying, look, you guys are looking really attractive, specifically on the tourism side. I know that's something that interests you. And uh, having those folks in there will be kind of really revolutionary for a lot of our communities. So I'm really excited for, for what's going to come next. So hypothetically, if a gentleman like myself was just happened to be in Clarence Rockland over the summer months and stopped yeah. into a Tim Hortons and asked a few of your residents what their major issue is for facing the future of their community, Economic development wasn't one that came up. Health, education, housing, financial issues, those were the, what I was hearing for someone yeah. who actually was in Clarence. <laughs> and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but no, how do you cool. how do you balance what council and yourself see as the biggest issue compared to what your residents are talking about? Because Again, some of them were talking about the pothole that was on their street. So yeah. there are small yeah. issues. There's large yeah. issues. You as counselor have to look at every single issue that comes to you. And you know, you've talked about it in this episode so far. You don't have an unlimited supply of money. So you have to kind of uh -huh. say no to some people. How do you balance the needs of what your residents want with what you believe is the need needed for the future of your community? Yeah, yeah. Um... Listen, I, I'm not. Um, I'm not one to say that I'm not. I'm always right. Again, it's an honor for a politician to say that. But um, being able to say, like, look, I'm wrong on this one, or maybe I'm not looking at it from the right angle, I think is is quintessential. Um, my reasoning behind it is that you know, if we're increasing our uh, uh, our corporate tax rate, we're able to lower it for residents, or at least we have a lot more money in, in where we're able to do things like fix potholes, or maybe focus on as well, housing, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, it's it's about making sure that we're not levying a lot of these new initiatives on the burden of residential property owners, which is kind of a bit of the strategy that's been going on, at least in the past few years. I just want to make sure that we're not taking money out of, uh, out of everyone's pockets to a greater amount than we already are. Um, and so, but again, I, I do acknowledge the fact that a lot of my, even my own residents might not have that same perspective, might think that we should be focusing on other things um and again sitting down and being able to, to have those conversations at community events even at tim hortons um is is really important and also just educating folks i myself am learning every single day on the job i have and always will and will continue to there's a million different things that i don't know and i'm excited to find out what they are um but a lot of residents also might not know the differences or the nuanced implications of something like affordable housing and you know what's the role of the municipality in that what's the role of the provincial government in that what's the role of the federal government in that because there is a touch everywhere on it. So sometimes right, I get some residents who are really riled up, but it's just like, okay, well, the municipality actually doesn't have jurisdiction in this. Uh, you know, it's a county issue or it's a provincial issue or it's a federal issue. It's education is so important. And, and again, it's another issue, but we don't have enough of it out of the province right now. Okay. <laughs> you, you've, you, you have just touched on the subject that is the nearest and dearest to my heart. Yeah. Residents understand understanding the jurisdictional roles of each level of government, whether it be county, provincial, federal, or municipal, or even school board. Yeah. But here's the thing, and I think this is the biggest caveat that I can ever say. They yeah. don't care. They do not care that you are a municipal politician or a provincial. They come to you. They want you to solve it because you have been elected to do that. How do you... Yeah. 
work within that constraint of understanding that, hey, education is not a municipal issue. It's a uh, parental issue. Affordable housing is in all three levels. And as much as the municipalities can do, they need federal and provincial governments to come to the table as well. How do you work in that constraint of understanding that your residents want you to address things, but you know, because of the jurisdictional levels and your uh, education through the Municipal Governing Act, that some things you can't solve. Yep. No, you're uh, you're absolutely right, Chris. Um, <laughs> you know, the folks do come at you and they just want you to solve the problem. They don't really yeah. care. Um, and, and you're definitely right. For me, the solution has been to be really involved um, with uh, federal, provincial uh, school board actors on all fronts. So that means going to events uh, for, for example, the Chamber of Commerce or making sure that we're going to golf tournaments and speaking with our federal MP, speaking with my MPP, speaking with colleagues of other municipalities, because, you know, sometimes we have, for example, water projects where La Nation wants some of our water, which was the case not too long ago. So being able to just pick up the phone and say, look, I might have a resident who comes up to me and says, look, I've got a really big issue on what my child is seeing, uh, I don't know, or what my child is hearing um, in the classroom or on their laptop, and I'm able to pick up the phone and call the school board trustee and say, look, I've got this resident, I'll forward you their email, here's the issue, right? So I'm, I, I don't have the power to solve the issue, but at least I'm pushing the resident in the right direction. And I'm not just saying like, I mean, to some extent I am, but I'm not just saying like, I, stop, I have nothing to do with this, I'm passing the puck along to someone else. I think having that personal touch with the other official is, is incredibly important because it does give merit to what the what the constituent is talking about or what they're really up in arms about so it's not a perfect solution and i uh i mean you're the ones who's heard from hundreds of mayors and counselors so you tell me what's have you heard anything that that counselors are doing to to try to no one can give me a straight answer except just pass it along (laughs) um yeah but it comes back to sort of a statement that you made at the top of the show is it comes with the title You can pick up your phone and talk to your MPP. You can pick up your phone and talk to your MP and they'll respond. They'll return those calls. You can pick up and talk to the school board trustee in your area because Mm -hmm. your, your title does go a long way as much as it it shouldn't matter. It sometimes it does benefit your residents as well. When you pick up the phone and make the issue a little bit louder. Yeah. And and look, when I talk to residents, sometimes residents are, are, are completely aware, right? That it's not a municipal issue. For example, I had a resident uh, it's a provincial issue, and they were like, "Look, I'm just, I'm not getting any air with this. Like, um, I, I just need someone to do something. Like, I'm just really frustrated." And they were completely aware that it wasn't any of my business, but I was still able to, you know, forward the the, the email and the concerns to to the MPP, which which has been responsive. So um, that's good. It, it's a step in the right direction. Again, I hate being that guy who's like I'm just passing the buck along, but to a certain extent, legally, right? We all have parameters that we have. Yeah. So I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time here and I know you're a busy person. So I want to talk about my favorite subject, as I said, tourism. I love tourism. I think that uh, more people should be spending their economic dollars here in Canada, in some of our great communities, because in my last recent uh, travels across Canada, I got to see some of these great communities, including Rockland up close and personal. So in your opinion... What are some of the hidden gems in Clarence Rockland that oh, for someone who's coming back there next uh, next summer for the AMO conference in Ottawa, I'll be making a special mm-hmm. trip out to you. Where should we be visiting? Yeah, look, I'm going to give a shout out to my local folks first in, in Ward 7, obviously. Um, we have the Hammond Golf Range, which is not only just a beautiful golf course, but also they are innovating genuinely like no other business I've ever seen uh, in the province. So they opened up a local brewery called Broken Stick within Hammond Golf. Uh, they've also opened up Hammond Hill, which is the first uh, eco-environmentally uh, conscious tourism sector or campaign tourism sector in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, and they, those folks are so resilient. As soon as they set up for their first season, um, they got hit with the dare jokes. It hit my community extremely hard. Um, They were completely destroyed, right? We're talking about acres and acres and acres of forests that were leveled. It destroyed pretty much everything they had built up to that point. And, uh, you know, within a couple of months, they're up and running and they are incredibly resilient. So I have to give them a shout out and they've got a beautiful site out there um, that, uh, and, and, you know, they're doing a lot of stuff as well with tiny homes, which is really innovative, really interesting. 
Um, we have a new, this is an upcoming project. I don't know if it'll be done by when you're visiting in town, but um, the Prescott Russell Trail runs right through uh, the municipality. We also have the Bourget train station, which we'll be remodeling uh, and making it into a bit of a pit stop for all the residents who will be traveling through the Prescott Russell bike trail, um, where we'll be serving, serving a lot of the local brews uh, that we have like Broken Stick. There's also a local brewery, uh, I always screw up the name, but Brauwerk Hoffman, uh, if I'm not mistaken. It's a local uh, German-centric uh, beer, and uh, they've got some really tasty sausages and pretzels, as well as amazing beer. That's down in Rockland. Uh, it's actually right in our industrial park, so definitely a hint hint at that. Um, those are, that's some of the local fanfare. We have Experience Unique, which is again in Hammond. That's more of a, a, a zoo type uh, situation, but ultimately um, our region is really known for, I'm going to go with beer, golf, uh, and anything outdoors. So we have some, we have that beautiful Fare la Rose. Uh, it is absolutely amazing uh, what we're able to do through there. There's also the um, uh, le, le Festival de Coureur des Bois, which is coming up, I believe in September, um, where there's a, a big community run throughout La Forêt La Rose. It raises a lot of funds for the community, and it's just beautiful. It's, it's quite it's quite a good time. Uh, those are some of the some some of the ones I have off the top of my head right now. But um, I, I completely agree with you that folks need to be spending their dollars in their own community. Um, I have seen other communities where they're kind of sleeper communities. People sleep there and then drive out or bus out uh, and then go work and spend their dollars somewhere else and then come back and only sleep there. I don't want my community to look like that and I think we're, we're taking good steps to make sure that it doesn't, to make sure that people are able to live, work and spend here uh, pretty effectively. So big shout out to our, our, our community but again more is coming because we have as I mentioned a couple of businesses who are pretty interested in the region specifically. So where do you go after a long day, after a long day of work and council meetings, where do you go to just decompress and resend yourself? And before you mention yeah. it, I, I joke this all the time, but I have to keep on reactivating it. You can't say your own house as much as you would <laughs> love to just sit in your own house. Where do you go yeah. in the community? Yeah, for sure. There's there's two spots. Um, there's Le Café Joyeux, um, which is in Rockland. Uh, it's a coffee spot. Fantastic coffee. The ambiance is amazing. The staff are phenomenal. I uh, have to give them a shout out. And obviously, it's, it's Broken Stick. It's my local brewery. I'm a big beer guy. Uh, and it's really, it's literally like two, three streets down from my house. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's essential. It's perfect. Their patio is absolutely breathtaking. So without a doubt, Broken Stick. So I'm going to end on this last question. It's kind of the most important question, Councillor. In your opinion, what makes Clarence Rockland such a unique place to live? to work and to raise a family? Yeah, God, what a great question, Chris. Um, for one, I think quintessentially we're one of the biggest, uh, one of the fastest growing communities in Eastern Ontario. We have incredible schools. We had incredible infrastructure, no matter how much I have uh, talked about it uh, lately. We have, I think, a really good mix of, of urban and rural. You get all types of flavors in, in, in Clancy Rockland. If you want somewhere where you... Um, you know, you just want to live in the city center of Rockland and you don't really want to use your car all that much, there's a place for you. And if you don't want your neighbors within five kilometers of you, there's a place for you in our city as well. Um, I think it's, and I'm hearing this a lot, um, the economic viability of bilingualism is important uh, and quintessential. People want to raise their kids in both official languages. Our community is the spot to do that. Uh, not to mention that we're also very close to Ottawa. So if folks are working in the, in the city, it's a good drive down. The drive usually will take me, I will say on Wednesdays when the public servants are working, it takes me a little longer than usual, but uh, the drive is, is, is about 30 minutes. I think it's, for me, it's the perfect blend because I'm able to work in the city and then I'm able to have peace and quiet and see the stars at night, um, which is essential. And our, our communities still have that community feeling, right? You still live in a community, you know your neighbors, you know their names, um, and you're able to get together sometimes. For example, we just had um, Hammond Together, which is a yearly celebration that we have as a community. It's just Hammond and Chenny. We all get together uh, at the park and hundreds of folks come out. There's a bunch of celebrations out there and you're able to get together with your community in a, in a nice and safe environment. And ultimately, I think that's what raising a family is about. It's being able to provide both for your children, but also yourself and do it in a safe place.
Trevor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with you and talk about a community that I just got to experience up close and personal. Um, so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and chat about yourself and Clarence Rockland. Oh, God, Chris, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's it's nice to have folks talk about uh, our municipality because I think it's fantastic. So I, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and educating folks as well on, on our, uh, our political system, both municipally, provincially, federally, et cetera. So I really had a, an amazing time. So thanks so much for the chat. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking.